Support for Iowa Catholic Radio and the Uncommon Good provided by Mercy College of Health Sciences. Learn more at mchs.edu. Welcome, folks, to the Uncommon Good with Bo Bonner and Dr. Bud Marr. Every week, diving deep into the truth of Catholic social teaching and restoring all things in Christ. The Uncommon Good is on the air. I'm Bo Bonner. And I'm Dr. Bud Marr. And we're coming to you from these United States of America, here in the middle of the country, Iowa, <laughs> where we both work in the middle of Des Moines, essentially, but right off of 235. That is Mercy College of Health Sciences, where I am uh, the Senior Advisor for Mission Initiatives and uh, the Director for the uh, Center for Human Flourishing. <laughs> Sorry, but what do you do uh, over yonder? So I'm the, I forgot for a moment, the Dean of Liberal Arts and Sciences. So I oversee, if you want to, if you want to study and learn about literature, science, math, we're there for you. All of those things. The and LAS of course, department. Uh, as always, we're underwritten by Mercy College of Health Sciences here at um, The Uncommon Good. So thank you for underwriting the show, mchs.edu. Uh, we just got done with fall break, bud. That's, I mean... It, it, it seems like the weather just cooperated right before fall break and actually felt like it. Um, but I think the students got a Friday off, and that means that we're on the downward slope towards the end of the semester. I keep ending it with the sort of uh, upturned question. But even if that is the case, you can go to mchs.edu at any time, see the multiple programs you can get involved in uh, the healthcare ministry, uh, the the ministry of healing that the Sisters of Mercy brought over uh, from Ireland with them, bud, nearly 125 years ago. MCHS.edu, thank you for underwriting the show. The Uncommon Good here, bud and I, happy to have you all with us. Yeah, so uh, speaking of liberal arts and sciences, you visited our department recently and gave a little talk on the Sisters of Mercy, our mission, our heritage. It's always it's always great for me to hear and to be reminded of uh, our glorious past and the uh, responsibility I think it places on our shoulders as the inheritors of that mission. What I told everyone is that my go-to when having a meal uh, is Panera because it's different enough. Funny enough, but I do not like going to Panera myself. But I feel like it's a good feast, like family feast situation. And yet again, it, it turned just correctly at the right time for us to all have yeah. soup. So if you can have soup and talk about uh, the mission of this college and how we inherited it um, from the Sisters of Mercy, uh, I think it's a good. I think it's a good afternoon. Yeah, I'm grateful for. I feel like autumn is finally crawling into existence, and it's been a reprieve for me for sure. So your soup hit the spot. Well, you didn't prepare it, but the soup that you. <laughs> arranged from Panera hit the spot the soup of uh the mission uh integration uh, idea yes um well speaking of people who uh I'm gonna see if I can pull this off bud who can take a lot of different ingredients <laughs> cook it down to a delicious broth of ideas of idea of a single idea um we are doing our radio reading roundup with John Henry Newman last week we talked about his apologia really about his life we're gonna roll into how his life uh, kind of brought up one of the major themes of a lot of his works, which is the history of the church, but also the development of doctrine. Um, and I actually think it's really important, but to talk about how grounded for him, all of those are in questions of history yeah. um, and not just like a novel doctrine to do uh, for the fun of it. Um, but I do think that this is a sort of uh, a natural way, like we, we talked about last week, he's a convert He's known for being a convert, but the idea is that this isn't an egghead who came up with some ideas and read his way into the faith. This really is this idea of a pastor on the ground struggling with the reality of the church um, and that the occasions that brought up what he talks about, what he's famous for, is because he had to answer real questions on the ground being pressed to him. Yeah, I was kind of a bad numinous this year because I started getting text on October 9th about, um, hey, happy feast day. I was like St. Ryan, or I, th I was thinking like Ignatius of Antioch, who's my patron saint. So I was wondering about these messages and like, oh yeah, this is um, the memorial of St. John Henry Newman. And it's cool on that day if you hop on the social media, which often is, you know, like its own thing, its own thing, mostly dead ends. Uh, <laughs> you see a lot of cool Newman quotes that day. So I just started pulling Newman quotes, lots of great stuff. 
We can probably reference a few this, um, on today's show. Absolutely. I saw you firing one up right ready to go when we get back from the break. This is the Uncommon Good. Bo Bonner, Dr. Budmar. Stick around. We'll be back right after this. <laughs> Back with the Uncommon Good, Bo Bonner, Dr. Bud Marr, joining you this week. Thank you for listening to the show. Be that on the airwaves all across central Iowa in particular, but also into the new uh, paths we're paving in the airwaves. Southern Iowa, west, east, maybe north, depending on the cloud cover, perhaps maybe Nebraska, Bud. I don't know. Have you ever heard us in Nebraska? Oh, I'm pretty sure people have listened to us in Nebraska. Oh, you mean uh, live? Via the radio waves. You'd be surprised. You and I were driving back from Lincoln, Nebraska a few weeks ago. And, we heard uh, a, oh, right, a Louisiana State LSU home game. So, yes, it's quite possible surrounding states have heard us. But if you don't have us uh, in those surrounding states or wherever you're at um, on uh, the airwaves, you can listen on iowacatholicradio.com live, also the Iowa Catholic Radio app. And then, of course, all our good podcast listeners, thank you for listening to the show. We're rolling along with our radio reading roundup on John Henry Newman. We're talking about... But his life and how it was the circumstance that brought up maybe, I don't know if, we, it's hard to say anything's yeah. most impactful about Newman. There's so much that he impacted. But I would have to say, off the top of many people's heads, him talking about the history of the church and the development of doctrine, um, it, it's a live enough option today that earlier this week, um, Matthew Levering uh, just posted a big old um, excerpt from a book that he's put in, pointing, uh, putting out that is about development of doctrine and its sort of contested nature and what he thinks it's about. You did your dissertation um, in this galaxy of topics. Um, clearly the church wrestling with its own history and what that has to, to say about today. Um, it's hard to imagine other things uh, that have more impact uh, from John Henry Newman, but I will say, folks, there are some that you could argue that he he's, has a wide range of impact, but I think it makes a lot of sense to talk about this one today, bud. So how is it that John Henry Newman's life and how he talks about it in the Apologia was the sort of efficient cause <laughs> of him bro broaching these massive topics for which maybe he's most known for his impact today in the church? Well, last week we talked about how important Newman was within the Church of England, <clears throat> a very like an all-star minister and scholar. So it was, it was very like scandalous or big news when he converted to Roman Catholicism. But we also mentioned at the end of last week's show that for Newman, he was always concerned about the real, that his faith, that his practice would not be in the realm of theory or ideas like abstract ideas, but that it would be enfleshed or incarnate. And so Newman, um, the reason I bring that up right now is that in his long career as an Anglican minister, He's committed to trying to heed his bishop's discipline and things like this. Like, for instance, he publishes this track 90, which is, I, I mentioned last week, like him wrestling with the doctrine that was articulated at the Council of Trent. And this is rejected. His, like, interpretation there is rejected resoundingly by, by like, the Anglican bishops. And so Newman kind of goes underground, as it were. Or maybe he just, he, he kind of, like, willingly listens to the request for him like not to work at Oxford and to stop publishing, et cetera. This is when he goes to little more, correct? Yep. So Newman, very much concerned about the real. He says by 1839 that he's on his Anglican deathbed. So meaning like he already Which kind of... Which is a great punk band. <laughs> Anglican that, deathbed. That should really be an album. Sorry. Go, go, go. To mix metaphors, he saw the writing on the wall, but he doesn't actually convert until 1845. And what's fascinating is during his last several months as an Anglican or like outside of the bounds of the Catholic Church... He actually, so to speak, like writes his way into Catholicism. So he's still wrestling with like what bothered him or what what troubled him about Catholicism is he saw parts of it that he thought were accretions or corruptions. And he he's concerned about antiquity and looking at Catholic doctrine and devotion today, he says like there seems to be things there that aren't in the earliest sources. But where Newman lands, I'm kind of giving away the end of the story now, is he writes his most famous essay, an essay on the development of Christian doctrine ultimately sort of unfinished because once he kind of um, unravels this, this in his head, he's ready to be received in the Catholic church. But the essay on the, the development of Christian doctrine in, in a nutshell is that he says there's the deposit of faith. So there's what the apostles received from Christ. It's a living idea that developed over time. And so he compares it sort of like 
an acorn growing into a grand tree. The tree is the living body of the acorn, but it's, it's achieved like a fuller, more mature form. That's a very simplistic way of summarizing the development of doctrine. It's funny because there's a lot of ways that you, there's a lot of ways that people have run with that metaphor and done a lot of things with it. Like you said, it's contested today. Yes. And, uh, and I think that what people get the most wrong about it, if you, if you will, is on one hand, if you don't read it in that history, like you just said it, that, I mean, it's not, I don't think it's fair to say he, like what we have as the document as it exists today is literally him sort of like live converting to the faith. Um, but certainly it shows what, what concerns people had about doctrinal error or what uh, accretions or, or mishaps, right? Like the messiness of the church that what wasn't happening, and this is where I'm, why, why, why him and Hong, Newman wasn't like, oh, I became Catholic. Now I have to defend why I did it. So I think that that's one thing they miss here. When he's doing this, he's saying, even if you're not Catholic, you have this huge problem if you're a Christian at all, which is to say, what's going on? And like you, we talked about last episode, he didn't, he didn't think the Protestant answer worked. And so the question starts to be, how do you have this lively sense of the, the church's history and deal with the fact that like there's, there's difficulties, there's disagreements and things like this. The one that I always like to point out, and I think the, that you, when you hear someone never mentioning that for Newman, a lot of this has to do with what's called Erastianism, which is to say state control of the church and where the church has got to where they are now. And the idea of the freedom of the church or the independence of the church is why you have to have something like talking about the development of doctrine, because how do you navigate like all of the interference, so to speak, that the church has faced over the centuries? Um, when you act, like you said, like it's just this sort of theory that makes sense of uh, it, it's sort of looking back to cover up mistakes, um, that it misses this point about how is it that in the middle of uh, the tossing sea that is the world and its history, that we can make sense of what's preceded and what's gone along. And the reason I like the tree metaphor, bud, is trees don't grow um, congruently. I mean, what's the right word? They're a lot less uniform than you think. If you look at a, you know, a tree from a far back or a, tr- a field of trees, you can go like, oh, yeah, they sort of have a similar shape. They kind of develop the same way. But all you have to do is see like how a branch you know, um, like grows around a fence post or something like this that you start to see the sort of knots and like warp and, and, and you know, the, the knuckles in a tree show that the church is living out what Christ says, that the gates of hell won't prevail against it, and that that's what, you know, John Henry Newman was deeply praying about and expressing when he wrote this document. Well, I think one way that folks go astray as they read this again is they think it's like a formula that you can apply. And Newman comes right out and says, this is a hypothesis to account for a difficulty. And what he means by that is every Christian body that claims to be the bearer of divine revelation must account for changes over time or explain their continuity with the apostolic church. Where Newman first landed as an Anglican is he appealed to the Vincentian canon, that we hold what is what was um, taught everywhere by everyone at all times. So, like, if you look back to antiquity, any teaching that was universal, meaning it was believed, like, across the, the reaches of the church and taught by all the bishops across time, that's what's to be believed. Newman says, like, that sounds great in theory, but it's very difficult in application because, you're like, you're weighing sources, like, how many times does something have to be mentioned before it's like said to be believed by all, et cetera. It looked like you were going to jump in there. No, no, no. Keep <laughs> going. I mean, I, that's, I, I'm, I'm learning uh, as the audience is learning too. that idea of, of making it a formula. I mean, look, I, I, I'll yeah. show the cards here. So Matthew Levering, like I said, just put this uh, essay out a little while ago. The big co- <laughs> op- opponent he has is David Bentley Hart. He's a very famous um, Eastern Orthodox sort of theologian. And so, who had a lot of problems with it. And I think you, you're, you're hitting the nail on the head, but that it's often Newman's enemies that want to make this formulaic in a way he never 
was interested in doing. Um, but I do think it's fair to say that when Newman, when this got popular, let's say around a certain council that happened <laughs> in the last century, um, it was sort of presented like he, there was this formula out of pro, like a formulaic solution out of problems. But the more you like, you know how we, we talked about this last week, Newman says the more you read into history, the more you cease to be Protestant. But the more you read about just Newman in general, you cease to think that that's what he was up to. And, and but can you like, what's the document that he, he made in Latin that was sort of like his um, Roman defense of, of, the, the, of the idea that's so, in some ways shorter and I, I would say more circumspect maybe yeah. that shows that like he didn't himself see the essay as, like you said, a perfect calculus that, that uh, arrived at the perfect solution. Yeah, he's studying in Rome. It's, com- it's commonly called the Newman Perone paper, but where he, he kind of spells out his idea in a tighter form for a famous Roman theologian and has it tested in things. I mean, um, a, a great scholar that we've worked with, Reinhard Hutter, he says as we wrestle with these questions, there's kind of errors in two directions. So there's like an evolutionary understanding of doctrine that doctrine almost like transforms across time, that would be sort of like a very like progressive way of understanding revelation. So we gain new knowledge and then what the church confessed can be like changed almost in substance. But on the flip side, like I think maybe more conservative minded Catholics are prone to an error in the opposite direction. And it's sometimes called, um, Pius XII talked about this actually, ecclesiastical antiquarianism. antiquarianism. Yeah. And it's sort of like trying to jump over history and sort of discern way back in the the mist of like early church history what the apostles believed. And it's driven by a good impulse, but it sort of freezes the magisterium. Yeah, the deposit of faith frozen in amber. It's almost Jurassic like a park version of a, it could be like a set of propositions that we could nail down. Right, right, right. Well, Newman, he like when I first read this passage, it really caught my attention because I grew up in a church where our apostolicity, so to speak, was that sort of like leaping across history. So we saw all these corruptions and mistakes, and we were going to jump back in time. But Newman points out, if you can forgive a quotation of sorts, he says, it is indeed sometimes said that the stream is clearest near the spring. Whatever use may fairly be made of this image, it does not apply to the history of philosophy or the history of belief, which on the contrary is more equable and purer and stronger when its bed has become deep and broad and full. Uh, he, he extends the metaphor. He talks like he's got this image of like a stream growing into a river and it becomes fuller and stronger as it progresses downstream. In time, it enters upon strange territory. Points of controversy alter their bearing. Parties rise and fall around the doctrines. Dangers and hopes appear in new relations. And old principles reappear under new forms. It changes with them in order to remain the same. In a higher world, it is other, otherwise, but here below, to live is to change, and to be perfect is to have changed often. That sounds like a great book title, but <laughs> That's right. No, but you think about something like the Arian controversy and this kind of idea that um, the Son of God was the first and greatest part of God's creation, but he wasn't co-eternal with the Father. And as this controversy raged in the early church, the defenders of orthodoxy, they tried to pin down the Arians and they would quote scripture at them, but the Arians were fond of scripture as well. You know, they would say, well, you know, Jesus himself said, no one is good except God alone. And finally to, to defend what the church had always believed the church, so to speak, I mean, this is kind of an imperfect language, but like they, they invented new language. They used uh, Greek philosophy and said the son was homo usios or consubstantial with the father there was something completely new about the art, that articulation, but in Newman's mind, he said this was uh, just um, it captured what the church had always taught about Christ. And when I think, if you, the, the the next layer that makes sense of that even more, that I think is brilliant with what Newman's pointing out, is that I like how he said parties rise and fall with the doctrine. So at the time. Like, let's bring up Homoousian, for instance, or just the Arianism debates. I, I just saw someone today make a dumb, like, point on a video where they're like, well, Jesus was something else, and then Constantine and his friends changed it, blah, blah, blah. So, look, Newman's talking about in history, there's just going to be all sorts of thorny and sticky human 
uh, messiness involved, right? Political ones like Constantine. Um, philosophical ones where like people genuinely were like, are we now going to like throw in Greek philosophy to make sense of this? What, what, what the development of doctrine presupposes, and like I love this idea that like the river eventually gets wide and deep, is the sort of human concerns of all that go away at some point. Yeah, they become detached from the very human um, trenches that we dug in order to have this debate, and so we might look. And this is where he's saying the development of doctrine is not this formula or this sort of rationale. This rationale that will explain like a, a math, um, you know, X formula, I keep saying formula, sorry. Yeah. Um, but what he's saying is like, yeah, like if you get deep down into it, you have to have faith to believe that Constantine's meddling and the Greek philosophers using a word that they were not accustomed to is guided by divine providence. But the development of doctrine is saying is like, once those buds burst forth, the flower, it's not that it's forgotten what's gone before it, but that it all starts to make sense the difficulty that it had to go through. You know, that's the plant metaphor. I like to think of it in terms of cheese, right? Cheese starts out as milk. It ends up in cheese. That middle part is stinky and gross and not quite anything. Um, but that has to happen. And in the middle of the stinky part of the cheese-making process, you can go, what are we doing? But as time goes but you have to believe in a continuity of development milk to stinky face to cheese to to really understand yeah. and and you do that process again this is my own opinion not john henry newman's but i've kind of made the point that i think his theory of development can only be applied backwards and what i mean by that is like sometimes when we talk about development of doctrine we think plug in a plus b and that will give us the right answer but if you're living through the arian controversy you might have not really a great bishop. And at the time, it feels like the controversy could go one way or the other. Now, the deposit of faith, the truth about Jesus Christ is, is static in a sense. Like, it's, it's unchanging. But there are these serious arguments. I mean, that's, that's tough to live through. And I think that's where Newman's phrase, it changes in order to remain the same as key. Yeah. Because you'll find writers today and they'll say, well, and this is simplistic too. They'll say like the church used to used to teach this about religious freedom. Now today it teaches this. Ergo, things change, and then they push for some sort of like radical change. Newman's always seeking the line of continuity. He's like, our goal is not change. Change almost happens like naturally or organically. Yeah, we're trying to find the golden thread that runs through it all. So that's where, for myself, I mean, if you were to go to like an academic conference about these matters, like people could seriously debate it. But I think Newman's idea of the development of doctrine is fundamentally conservative, not like in the political sense of the term, but that he's trying to say, how do we preserve the apostolic faith? And for me, Bo, the quote, like the, the kicker for all of this is um, it's from a lesser known writing of, of his, but he's talking about the immaculate conception. And he points out like the church's articulation of that in the 19th century, again, sounds different than maybe what you would have read in the fifth or sixth century. And so he's sort of wrestling with this idea and he's saying like people have pressed him like would the church fathers really believe what the church now teaches about the Immaculate Conception. And Newman says, if consulted on the matter, St. Paul could not have understood what is meant by the phrase, the Immaculate Conception. But if he had been asked whether or not our lady had the grace of the spirit, anticipating all sin whatsoever, including Adam's imputed sin, he would have answered in the affirmative. So there's these new concepts that, you know, of course, wouldn't have made sense to St. Paul. They're in a different language for one thing. But if you conceptually broke it down, he's saying what the church affirms today in its dogma, the the fathers and the apostles themselves would have affirmed as well. I mean, in some ways, it's a very basic idea that, you know, there's, um, to use like sort of logic language, there's terms and then those are the words for terms. And terms stay the same. We just might use different words to say them. So for instance, um, what is, uh, I'm trying to think of an easy one. The word nice, for instance, has come to be a compliment, but it used to mean someone who was like, it, it meant more like brand new, it, like sort of like a, 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 an idiot who was not knows the world. And so you would talk about someone being nice and uh, it was, it wasn't great to be called that. 
and so those two concepts have always existed. There's things that like aren't are are are, are new to the world, and they're not these. They've they, this is their first rodeo, and they're not ready to go. But there's also um, people who are you know good, and it, and it's pleasant to be around them, and things like this. And the word nice has shifted. It's gone from one thing to the other. And there's a development, right, that if you look backwards, you can see how the shift happened, but the terms didn't change. There was always these two groups of people, but we've used a different word to describe them. Something similar like this is what I think you're, like Newman is saying and how you put that out. Well, we're at a break, so we're going to take a, a quick stop here. This is the Uncommon Good Bob Bonner, Dr. Bud Mar. Stick around. We'll be back right after this. <laughs> Back with the Uncommon Good, Bo Bonner and Dr. Bud Marr joining you this week. Thank you for listening to the show. We are doing the radio reading roundup about John Henry Newman, talking about how his life led him to be one of the most well-known people talking about how the history of the church and the development of doctrine operates through time. But at the end of last segment, I think you really put a, a great way, if I can rephrase it just a bit, Newman's theory is not predictive, it's actually an interpretive theory. It's sort of like a yeah. hermeneutic or a discipline of reading the past. Because you made this point that it, not only does it don't not it's not going to predict the future well, but it's actually really hard to appeal to the development doc, development of doctrine in the here and now. You can do it somewhat, but it's best to look at it in the past to make sense of what we might be surprised at, what we might have be difficult having difficulties with. Or when we're appealing to the past about current debates, how we might be able to see both sides, not just to be like, oh, well, we see both sides and we're being you know, nice or kind, but to see how that event um, you know, caused the deposit of faith to grow, uh, for a branch of it to bloom in a certain way, and what that might mean for us as we wrestle um, w- with current questions. Um, you were bringing up, for instance, like the idea of um, freedom of religion. Yeah. And I think uh, someone who's a very important mentor in my life, Russell Hittinger, has made this sort of Newmanian point, which is to say it was impossible for humans to talk about freedom of religion before you had nation states like we do now. So to demand, for instance, for someone in 850 to, to talk about religious freedom in the terms of dignitatis humanae. And, you know, I, I think there's all sorts of ways that we talk about the interpretation of documents itself, especially with that one. But his point is to say, it's not saying that we've evolved or that the doctrines changed. It's that there were no such things as democracies, m- much less like uh, totalizing nation states in 850. It would be like saying, why didn't Jesus talk about like, rules of thumb to use the internet back in 33 AD Mm -hmm. is it would be use like even like it would be useless to talk about those things back then. Right. And I think that that's one thing about this is it's sort of a, a, it's a ecclesial humility that I think people misread because a lot of times people go like, Oh, well Newman's just trying to be triumphalist for instance. Right. And like show a way that you can read about the church always, you know, getting the W's and victories, Mm -hmm. but it's actually quite, a humble thing, which is to say the church has enough to talk about on its plate now that there's no way in its pastoral mission in the world that it's going to completely predict every problem that shows up in the future. You know, this is our Lord saying there's enough evil for today. We don't have to worry about tomorrow's evil. And so there's a way in which Newman's doctrine of development is about how we got to the evils that we're dealing with today and that's enough. We don't need to act like the deposit of faith answers all questions for, for all time 2,000 years ago. Well, I think I, I like your idea of, of it being like an interpretive theory or hermeneutic. And part of the way I think you see this, Bo, is in the differences between the editions of the essay that Newman published. So Newman was famous. He loved like revising his work and trying to get it really correct. So the essay on development is finished in 1845. But Newman releases a new edition in the 1870s. In the first edition, Newman talked about the seven tests of authentic development. I think as he saw people read his work and they're like, oh, yeah, we can just apply these tests and say, like, this was the right direction. This wasn't. 
he changed it, the language specifically to seven notes of authentic development. So he was saying, as we look at um, doctrines that are taught, what are the notes or characteristics of an authentic development? You know, it's things like continuity and principles, anticipation of the future, conservative action upon the past, chronic vigor. He's saying like authentic developments, as we trace those out across church history, we see that they have these sorts of characteristics, a kind of vigor, like true doctrine has a way of persisting, whereas false ideas fall to the wayside. So again, not a formula. There's not like strict test, but hopefully a useful hum- hermeneutic. I like the point also that you make about um, religious freedom and how you talked about that. You and I, of course, at Mercy College, we teach a course on bioethics. And and really, like the church couldn't speak to in vitro fertilization yeah. in the Middle Ages. Why didn't Jesus talk about chimeras? You're like... Uh, <laughs> well, CRISPR well, genes, yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Today, uh, even recently, our good friend Charlie Camosi, he published an article about a recent development, crazy enough, where scientists have created an embryo without the use of sperm or an egg. And so you think about the kind of like troubling ethical questions that that, that sort of thing brings up. But what all of, all of that reminds us is no Christian can avoid these questions. Right, right, right. Like they come up, how is the church going to speak to things happening today? And as Catholics, we have to be careful because you do find um, a sort of tendency sometimes to, like, think about it this way. Like, the apostles were not praying the rosary. Right. <laughs> the rosary is a later, a later devotion. Uh, when they talked about the real presence, they didn't use the language of transubstantiation. Now, I believe all of us should pray the rosary. And transubstantiation, of course, is for me, and according to the teaching of the church, probably the best articulation about what we believe regarding the Eucharist. But as Catholics, you know, we do have to give an account as to how that's the case. We can't just um, shove our head in the sand there. And I think that what I like the best about this when it's taken in the spirit that Newman wrote it, he constantly says, you have to have faith for this to work. So... It's not a matter of, again, like a computational theory of like how history and, and it's, it's the best one. It's much more like, you know, Peter in his letters saying, you have to defend the joy that's in you. And so if you have this faith, and so then people ask, but this is how ha- history happened and it went X, Y, and Z, then this is how you defend the faith that's in you. You go, I know that there's a deposit of faith and I know that it's heading towards the eschatological reality of the church at the end of time. Here in the middle, this is our best way to say, this is what it means for the gates of hell not to prevail against the church, and this is what it means for us to say why it is that our Lord has tarried as much as he has. He's allowed history to happen, and that doesn't mean that, like you said, deposit, the, the, the faith needed to improve, it, that it, it's, it needs to go out and, and spread to all nations, and that nation's but is not just geographic, it's through time, mm-hmm. and so... There will be, just like if you, when the first apostles went to, you know, Spain, and at Spain it wasn't Spanish yet, so whatever the the barbarian tribes were speaking at that time, they had to translate the gospel into that language. So why wouldn't you have to translate it into the language of 1528 or 1828 or 2028? Like, that's just what has to happen. And so it's not that we change doctrines that we learn to talk about what the doctrines have always said in new circumstances that because we are beings living through time, we couldn't have, it couldn't have been understood to write them down. That's why like Nostradamus and all of these things when people are like, they predicted the future. And it's always like, because they said something like the fourth grasshopper will be on the eighth hill. And you're like, yeah, that meant uh, Tesla self-driving cars. And you're like, well, because they couldn't write the words, Tesla would have a, a, a self-driving car. All of that would have been nonsense, bud. And if you were an editor who saw it, you're like, oh, well, the monk was drunk who wrote this. And you'd throw it out because it made no sense. Yeah. So that's why our Lord wasn't like, oh, by the way, there's going to be internet. Please don't use it to say you're a Nigerian prince and ask for money. None of that makes like... Of course, we didn't say that in the past. It was for our time, just like it was for missionaries to translate it when they made it to new lands. It is for us to translate it as we arrive at the borders of new time. When we talked about our own conversions, we were saying, like we've heard sometimes from friends and relatives, like, well, you were looking for the perfect church. Like, 
the perfect sort of place where you could, so to speak, like switch off your mind or whatnot. Um, like Roman Catholicism doesn't avoid the messiness or the complications or the difficulties. It doubles or triples. Them. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> but Newman makes the point that 10,000 difficulties does not have to add up to a single doubt. So you can face dif- difficulties and wrestle with challenges and still have faith. And for him, you see this in his own life. So he writes this essay on the development of doctrine. And you might think that Newman's proffering it as sort of like a rubber stamp for whatever the church decides. But really his Catholic life in a lot of ways is him struggling with what he's seeing within the church. So um, the years go on and we get to 1869 and 1870 where the church holds the first Vatican council. And the first Vatican council said a few different things. It's most known for it's teaching about papal primacy and papal infall- infallibility. And so uh, that council affirms that there are occasions when the Pope, speaking specifically in virtue of his office, teaches something that is binding upon the entire church. And, and, and the First Vatican Council says when the Pope does so, like our, uh, God will preserve him from error. So Newman was invited to the council. He doesn't go. But my point in bringing this back to the development of doctrine is that when Vatican I takes place, you might think Newman's just like gung-ho, like, oh, new new development. This right, is right, great. Right, right. He really struggles with this. And part of it is that many of his former friends, I say former because like this kind of causes a rupture in their, their friendship with each other, but also just like bishops and people he sees around them, they go for what's called like a maximalist interpretation of papal infallibility. infallibility. That word is hard for me to say for some reason today. Um, sort of like when the Pope sneezes, it's without error, but I mean, less, um, like more seriously, like anything that the Pope says, whether it's about politics or, uh, he, he rolls on like a, a a popular sort of like societal issue today that possesses this infallibility. And Newman says like, hold on, hold on, tap the brakes. There are specific occasions and specific criteria about what constitutes an infallible statement. And so like when the Pope is speaking at the dinner table, this is not to be conflated with what we, what we say about him speaking ex cathedra. And so my point is like Newman, he doesn't shut off his brain. He doesn't say like, Oh, the church is just this sort of Oracle that like churns out new truths. The essay on development is him really trying to say like, how do we make sense of the church's witness across time? Now you make a great point. He has faith that the Holy spirit is guiding the church and that the Holy spirit won't let the church defect or fall into error, but it's not, it's not simplistic or fundamentalist in any sense of the word. No, in fact, I'd say that the, the, the doctrine on development as he sees it is minimalist is he says, we, <laughs> when, when a branch must develop uh, or, or bloom or whatever, um, he is in the camp to say it might have to happen, but this is where he's the true conservative. He goes, we should interpret it, so to speak, not as mutely as possible, but um, as not this grand um, change. And so th- th- that people people see it. And so even if it's necessitated, and I think that um, you can tell me, you're, you're the historian that would know this better. I think technically Newman, at least, you know, he kind of, he's thinking about it live like the rest of the people were at the time. I think he kind of ends up as an inopportunist mostly that he goes there's it's it's essentially yes of course he, he like by faith he'll he'll um sign on to it but it's sort of like it was inopportune because the the ultramontanists and the people who were uh they they felt a lot of political reasons to go whole hog saying yeah. everything the pope says must be true for political reasons that were on the ground I mean, for instance, troops marched on Vatican I. I mean, like, there's a lot of reasons why people were like, we need this pope to be able to stand against the nations of the world, and it's understandable. But what Newman's saying is, there's all sorts of reasons, yet again, but we come back to the human fallible messiness. It might be that a lot of the cardinals and bishops at the time, so to speak, got behind Vatican I for wrong reasons, like political ones, because they were scared about what was going on in the 19th century. But Newman says... That can be the, the operation of the Holy Ghost, but that means that we need to be restrained and, and take a sort of minimal interpretation about how even things that look like developments go about. 
Yeah. And what's funny is I think all sorts of people who decide they have Newman behind them, conservative and liberal, progressive and traditional, or even people who think they've got Newman pegged and they go beyond him, they really miss this point and it would do them a lot of good. For instance, like I said in this article that Matthew Levering's debating with uh, David Bentley Hart, from our good friends Church Life Journal, thank you Artur Rossman for his uh, role in getting that published. You know, there's a sort of way in which, bud, because there's this messiness of human life, you throw up your hands completely and just go, well, at the eschaton, it will all make sense. And who knows, maybe this position the church said in this year will be totally reversed. And Newman goes, that's like the complete opposite of what I'm trying to say. Because even if it's the case that when, like you said, we look back to interpret what happened, we're going to go like it's a tree that's growing purposefully from a point to a place that it's going so our best instinct is to interpret those developments minimally, not maximally to say like in a triumphalist way, the church is right and can do whatever it wants, but nor is it a, a defeatist that goes, just hold your hands up, folks, because who knows where the church will end up. No, even in messy times, prayerfully, even if we see in a mirror darkly, we can both see where this is all coming from and we can begin to see where it's going and we can have hope in the continuity of all of it. Yeah, Newman has this really unique image of the church where in the New Testament, when we look at our Lord, we say that he embodies. So there there are scriptural images. There are images of prophets, priests, and kings in the Old Testament, and they serve important authoritative functions. And theologians say that Christ embodied those perfectly. So Christ was prophet, priest, and king at the same time. We say that he had like a threefold office. Newman takes that idea And he applies it to the church. So he says the church has a prophetic quality, it has a priestly quality, and it has a regular kingly quality. And Newman says these kind of function in sort of like a a dialectical way where the regal office, like the ruling or governing office, it's concerned about evangelism and sort of like spreading the message of the gospel across the globe and has to govern the different parts of the body of Christ to do so. The prophetical office, he actually attributes to the whole body of the faithful. And I say the whole body because you would think it would maybe just be reserved for like priest or something. No, I'm getting that wrong. I'm sorry. The priestly or sacerdotal office. But he says that's really the church's devotion. Yeah, the priestly office. The, yeah, yeah, the, yeah. the priestly office is like the devotional quality of the church. The prophetical office is theologians. And he says theologians have to kind of restrain the kingly office, like where the kingly office maybe seeks to extend its role sort of in a tyrannical manner. It has to always be pulling the church back to revelation or to, or to the gospel. But like theologians, they can go off the rails as well. And their particular temptation is rationalism where it's like, it's all intellectual. And so you can begin to see where Newman has this very kind of like dynamic understanding of the church and his threefold office, he says can account for abuses because there are times where, the, the regular kingly office like extends its reach too far. There are times where it ha- like that part of the church has to pull back theologians. And so you get this very kind of like lively dynamic as he looks at the church. Well, it's interesting, right? Because I'm sure some people be like, well, this is just checks and balances. But I actually have a better one than that. I don't think he's taking this from polity. Um, so on one hand, right? So to think about this circle, as you said, the regal office checks the theologians, um, well, let me back up. I would say that the normal act, you know, is the prophetic office checks the regal office. The regal office directs the priestly office, right? Because if we go off too mystical and things like that, then uh, it, it will become just like all in our heads or just uh, off the, you know, it, it will be all about us. The priestly office, like the people, right? This is what he calls about the census fidelium, right? Like the sense of the faithful, check the theologians because the theologians prompted to be too rational. Um, so anyway, my point is like these, these all are mutual in reinforcing. What this sounds like, but is what we're going to talk about next week, which is his theory of liberal arts, funny enough, where he goes, knowledge is a circle, right? And if you take any part of it out, including theology, other parts will take up what's vacated and then you will get a perversion of knowledge itself. I'm glad you pointed this out because I didn't make the connection until just now that Newman is really serious about this idea of offices and knowledges and all of these things taking their rightful place and not overextending themselves because he believed, and I tip my hat to Dave Delio, who always made this point to me, Mm. it's integrated, right? Like he believed in an integral relationship 
whether it was knowledge itself, whether it was the function of the church, history itself. He's really good about talking about distinctions within a unified whole, but how they're integrated in such a way that, like you said, they check each other, but it's their distinctions and complementarity that make them live. Uh, And then, like you said, abuses or incongruencies can be explained when one aspect is either muted or overtaken by another, both in the life of the church, but also in intellectual life, like I said, which we'll talk about next week. Oh, I thought we were up against the clock. I'm we sorry. are. You have 30 <laughs> minutes, 30 minutes to like uh, summarize the rest 30, of your book. 30 seconds. No, teasing. <laughs> no I, I think I keep coming back to the importance of faith. And after Vatican one takes place, Newman has uh, souls who are looking to him and they're troubled. They say, I can't make sense of what the church is, is, is saying right now. And Newman says, let's have a little faith. Like uh, uh, God will bring up, uh, like he says, like Pius is not the last Pope. God will raise up uh, a future Pope or a future council, not to contradict what Vatican I says, but to trim the boat. And so he has faith like the bark of Peter is still under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. And so for us today, as we wrestle with things that we see around us, we have to have that faith knowing that like, even if like the answer that we would want in our lifetimes isn't provided, that God will preserve the church from error and that like that light will shine throughout all of time. Absolutely. This is the Uncommon Good. Bob Bonner, Dr. Bud Mars. Stick around. We'll be back right after this. Back with the Uncommon Good. Bob Bonner and Dr. Bud Mar joining you this week. Thank you for listening to the show. Bud, we're wrapping up today's episode of the Radio Reading Roundup with John Henry Newman. Last week, we talked about his life. We talked about his life leading into uh, the great controversies with church history and um, the uh, uh, development of doctrine. But I think, I hope that this set up nicely to then go talk about his theory of what I would say is education and, and knowledge. So hopefully next week we can talk about idea of the university, also his uh, lectures about the Benedictine schools, and I'm hoping a little bit grammar of ascent if we want to go cray-cray. That one is probably one of the more difficult ones, but I think the grammar of ascent uh, is a way to connect all that he talks about this with development of doctrine and church history with his theory of education. But either way, I am, uh, I'm, I'm grooving with the direction we're going uh, with this radio reading roundup. Well, you just scared me a bit there. Um, I ha- <laughs> had to take a deep breath. No, the grammar of a sin will be amazing. Glad to get into Newman's theory of education. We should see uh, if Mercy College wants to like specially promote next week's show. Oh, because well, <laughs> it'll be like it'll be liberal education. The idea of a university. I like that. Well, I mean, so uh, I don't know how we uh, get that on the banners or anything. So <laughs> that might be saying a bit much, but. In the meantime, Bud, uh, before, if we can't get uh, banners officially saying that like yeah. we're going to be considering this, what can people do with us in the meantime in the prayer life here with Iowa Catholic Radio? Yeah, please do uh, join us in our prayer life. Uh, we pray the rosary on air at 6 a.m. and 10 a.m. The Chaplet of Divine Mercy every afternoon at 2.55 p.m. You can also use the Iowa Catholic Radio app to pray the rosary anytime, anywhere. And then if you folks are interested in the goings about uh, in Iowa Catholic Radio land, um, Central Iowa, the the places that we're expanding, you can always go to iowacatholicradio.com and hit events. Just a few of them, October 19th in Winterset at 630 at St. Joseph Catholic Church. Joe Heschmeyer from Catholic Answers. November, uh, we have, well, some of the people are going on that 15th anniversary footprints. Uh, Well, they were going to the Holy Land. Interesting. (laughs) Uh, we'll talk about that one later. <laughs> we'll see if that happens. November 11th, West Des Moines, St. Francis of Assisi, uh, Jeanette Williams, Women of Grace, discusses spiritual warfare. So that's a ladies' event. Um, and then, of course, December 8th, the big one. At 6 p.m., downtown Des Moines Embassy Suites. Uh, that all starts uh, 6 o'clock, the dinner at 7, and hear from Dr. David Anders. But, of course, uh, this is a ministry that's more than just the people here on air behind the desks or uh, running around uh, raising money and funds. Uh, it is your ministry as well. I know that we I've seen with the Iowa Catholic Radio um, emails, we still have a ways to go to get our end-of-the-year funds raised. So if you have it on your heart prayerfully to give, please do so. iowacatholicradio.com, 515-223-1150. You can, of course, text 515-223-1150 as well. Bud, great show. Looking forward to next week. Yeah, thanks for humoring me and letting us, letting us talk so much about John Henry Newman. It is easy to do uh, because, like I've told people uh, myself, 
Um, he won't leave me alone, so we may as well talk about him on radio, on the airwaves. This is the uncommon good. May Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace, reign in our hearts, our families, city, state, nation, solar system, galaxy, the whole kit and caboodle. This is the uncommon good, and we'll be back next week. The uncommon good with Bo Bonner and Dr. Bud Marr is heard every week on wonderful Catholic stations like this one and anytime on podcast. Just search for The Uncommon Good. Support for Iowa Catholic Radio and The Uncommon Good provided by Mercy College of Health Sciences. Learn more at mchs.edu.